Welcome to our session, What's Wrong with Activism? My name is Judy Ling Wong. I'll be your host for the panel. And I'm a poet, painter, and environmentalist, probably best known as the honorary president of Black Environment Network. I have a wonderful panel with me, and I'll ask them to introduce themselves. So Dominic, would you like to say something? My name is Dominique Palmer. I'm really excited to be here with you all today. I'm a climate justice activist and environmentalist based in the UK, and I focus a lot of my work on intersectionality. One of the organisations I'm part of is Fighters of the Future, which is a global youth movement organising climate strikes. And I'm a coordinator for an organisation called Climate Live, which is a youth-led, it's youth-led and it's focused on harnessing the power of music to unite people for climate justice. So I'm really excited to be here today and I like bringing arts, music and culture together and we'll be speaking more about that later. So Lee. Um, hello everyone, my name is Lee Pivnik. I'm an artist uh, in, based in Miami, Florida. Um, this is my first time in Europe, so thank you for this grand welcoming. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, I work between sculpture and video and social practice. Um, my work is generally uh, influenced by looking at living systems and other species um, and trying to uh, support mutualistic relationships and mimic them through that research uh, and steer us away from extractive economies. Um, I do that in part through my work with the Institute of Queer Ecology, which is a project I founded in 2017, um, which is an artist publishing platform that works on publications and films and exhibitions. Uh, most recently, we made a video game, so we, we work across disciplines, but bound by the idea of um, relooking at nature and environmental issues in light of queer theory and the lessons we can learn through that. Um, and so, yeah, I, w I think we'll talk a bit today about um, uh, like the role LGBTQ plus people can play in the environmental movement, not just as a marginalized group that's more vulnerable to climate change, but actually as one that has innate skill sets through lived experience um, that can contribute a lot. Thank you. Taishan. Hi, my name is Taishan Hayden Smith, and I'm from North Kensington, Labrick Grove, and um, I'm founder of Grow to Know CIC, which is a nonprofit pivots on um, reclaiming space to reconnect people with nature and each other. Um, which was, which kind of was exhibited, well, the, the, the healing and unifying powers of nature um, were really highlighted in the aftermath and response to Grenfell Tower Fire, which is where I live. Um, and yeah, I've just since um, tried to find my way through trying to bring nature and gardening and um, to, to, to education, um, but also within communities. So I consider myself a bit of a community activist, um, but also I play a bit of football on the side. Before, I probably would have mm -hmm. spoken about football first, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> but my life's kind of flipped around a bit, so, um, and I'm also father to, to two young children, um, which drives a lot of my work as well. And we have two members of our panel on screen, very far mm -hmm. away, but very much with us. Mm -hmm. So Pauline, let's hear mm -hmm. from you. Hi, my name is Pauline, is Pauline Castres. I'm really happy to be joining you remotely from London today. So I'm an award-winning public policy analyst with over 10 years of experience working with lots of different policymakers local, at a local level, national level, internationally. I work a lot at the intersection of disability and climate, and I'm also an artist. And I've also written several pieces about the status of disabled migrants in the UK. Um, so yeah, today I'm hoping to bring my um, knowledge of climate policy and also my lived experience as a um, disabled climate activist. Thank you, Pauline. And Sarah Elvira? Yeah. Hi, my name is uh, Sarah Elvira Kuhmonen, and I'm right now in uh, Gothenburg in Sweden. Uh, but I am from northern part of Sweden, in, from Jokkmokk, uh, from a reindeer herding family. So my uh, family, we are uh, living uh, very close to the nature and have uh, the reindeer that we follow uh, during the year. Uh, I'm also I'm the president of the Sami Youth Association in Sweden, uh, Sami Nora. And Sami Nora, we create meeting places for our Sami youth here. And uh, we do this through our projects and local associations. And then we also are uh, very engaged in the political uh, situation in Sweden with uh, issues that are uh, yeah, including us. Thank you, Sarah. And I heard you are a very beautiful singer, and I was going to ask you if you would sing for us. <laughs> <laughs> so 
something very short. I've heard you on YouTube. You've got lots of very yeah, you know, short well, songs. I'm, I'm also minutes. a musician, and uh, yeah, I can do that. I can um, uh, yoik for you. Uh, it's uh, the Sami way of uh, singing. And then maybe I have to mention that uh, the Sami people, we are the only recognized indigenous people in Europe. And we live in the northern part of Norway, Sweden, Finland, and uh, Russia. Uh, and this York, it's called Djokoli, uh, and that means to to be brighter. Uh, I really hope that the sound is good now when I'm digital attending. Te daba seño de olo, te leina colo, lo, 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 te leina colo, lo. thing to finish our introductions with. And it also links us to the fact that the arts are so powerful. Not just words, but things that go beyond words. The tone and the sense of people that singing and so many of the arts bring us. Allow us to expand our consciousness and reach out to different diverse people in a very beautiful way. Thank you again, Sarah. So this event today is to question how can marginalized communities be given platforms so they can begin to expand the narrative of the mainstream? What can we do in terms of equality and opportunity so that we can do this? We're at a very special point of crisis in climate, not just any crisis. This crisis means that it threatens human survival itself. Historically, this has never happened. So this is a time where we need everybody, all hands on deck. We really cannot afford to leave anybody out. Because when we leave communities out, we firstly do not hear from them about their very specific needs. The other thing is that we do not hear from them about their very specific contributions. Each of the communities that are represented today have something special to offer. And you'll find our panelists illuminating what that special contribution is. And this is where often communications which are sound bite size do not do this. They say, okay, we accept, we got to include people and so on. But it doesn't go further. So that all of us have that sense of excitement a sense that we as individuals can expand our consciousness because of the experiences, the lived experiences of many very different people who are so enriching, they bring us so much. So we are about opening up this conversation today and hope that you will engage with us. So first of all, I'm going to turn to Lee and ask him one of the key questions. We already know that excluded groups are very much marginalized because of the way media and other communications actually portray them. What can you tell us that should be done in order for them to awaken that we are much more, that the message not only needs content, it needs space and time in order to give the communication what it needs to do? Thank you. Um, yeah, I think of course, journalism is going through a, a reckoning right now as it tries to deal with shortened attention spans and smaller budgets and is having a really rough time. So I, I do sympathize with, with media at You're large right now. Um, but when it comes to marginalized groups, I think that one of the biggest issues they have is seeing um, disadvantaged groups as 
you know, they, they cast them as vulnerable first and foremost, and then they have a hard time moving past that to the strengths. And so I think, you know, it's, it's showing up in IPCC reports now very clearly that like we understand that the communities that have done the least to create carbon emissions are now the, you know, at the forefront of global warming and its consequences. Um, those are often communities of color, they're often indigenous communities. Um, in the case of LGBTQ uh, rights, I think that it's, um, it's a broadened community that experiences things uh, differently. You have a kind of intersectional like way where of course like your uh, queerness then interfaces with your, your ethnicity and your uh, economic level. Um, but it, you know, at its worst, we see things like um, trans people being turned away from hurricane shelters during Hurricane Katrina. We see uh, homelessness at a higher rate in LGBTQ communities than in not. And I think in, in the UK, I was reading yesterday, it's 25% of, of youth that are homeless identify as LGBTQ+. And so, of course, then when you experience climactic uh, catastrophe, uh, that, of course, overlays. But beyond that, I think, and I think that media kind of gets that now, but what the stories I want to be told uh, are the ones of what we bring to the table that aren't there already. And so, um, of course, we like, I, I think when I say queerness, a lot of us think about sexuality. I want to introduce a quote from Bell Hooks that kind of expands on that a bit. Um, and so Bell Hooks writes, uh, queer not as about who you're having sex with, that can be a dimension of it, but queer is about being about the self that is at odds with everything around it and that has to invent and create and find a place to speak and to thrive and to live. And so through this, queerness opens up this kind of futurity, it opens up this worlding um, that's very utopian. Um, that I think is necessary in terms of dealing with the climate because we're stuck in this of like mainstream climate pessimism right now. And of course it it's, makes sense, it's logical, we're watching very little progress <laughs> happen at the rate that we need it to. Um, but uh, queer life, I, I, I kind of bring into two categories of the individual and the collective. Um, and through each there's a strategy that can be learned and distilled into climate strategy and so at the individual level, I think queerness teaches us about mutability. Uh, it's an embodied life of fluidity and resisting categorization. Um, but, you know, reshaping your identity in response to things you're seeing um, and this, like, refusal of being a static person or being one thing in life um, in a way that on a changing planet, I think, is a, a life tool that's helpful to lean into in a world that's very uh, static and rigid and built for permanence. Um, when we're moving into a more impermanent, um, precarious state. And then at a collective level, queer community is about mutualism. It's about this kind of mutualistic, symbiotic relationship between members of the community and members without it, but the, this uh, mutual support network that steps in in the absence of families um, or in the absence of governments or support systems. Um, and so it's a space of eccentric economies um, but it's this like reciprocal care-based community. Um, these are not uh, themes, these are themes I think that are embodied by the queer community, but not unique to the queer community. They're found in feminisms, they're found in indigenous cosmologies, they're found in Afrofuturist things. And so I think that, um, but they're, they're not found in capitalism <laughs> is the thing. And so um, a lot of what I do with my project, the Institute of Queer Ecology is to try to elevate uh, solutions on the periphery. Mm. Can you talk a bit about the art projects that you do? You know, very often people think that artists just produce products that are artistic to sell, but now art is so much more complex. We recognize that we change ideas, we talk about process and so on. Just a little bit about your art would be really great. Yeah, well, the, the project itself is, an, is like an expanded artwork. Um, it is not so much an institute in the very formal sense, but it's mimicking one both as the kind of subversive institution academic model to get artists at the table for environmental decision making. Um, but it's also kind of mimicking an organism. It's this uh, like blurry group of artists. It's co-run by uh, myself and um, uh, evolutionary biologist named Nicholas Baird. Um, and we, for five years, have been opening it up as a platform for collaboration that over 125 artists have participated in. And so we make these collective projects that 
I'll, I'll talk about a film briefly as an example, um, because they're, it's all over the place, but the, <laughs> a, a film we did was called Metamorphosis, and it talks about this kind of planetary transformation away from extractionary industries, away from oil and gas, and towards something of solar and wind and renewables. But it does this in a long-form kind of video manifesto um, that is... Uh, following the metaphor of a caterpillar becoming a butterfly. And so it's like a three main episodes in this short film. Um, one is called Grub Economics that points to caterpillars as kind of a figure that we can relate to now as a hyper consumer. <laughs> um, and then it gets to the moment in the cocoon in the second episode where the caterpillar is uh, literally dissolving itself and liquefying its body um, to become and reformat into something new. Um, and this moment of liquidation, is, of course, like has like an economic association uh, similar to the kind of Green New Deal uh, scenario we need to support financially uh, to not just talk the talk, but create an economy that functions around uh, a renewable world. And then it ends on this figure of a butterfly, but the, the butterfly we have emerge is um, uh, taken from a scan at the University of Florida's collection of a gynandromorphic swallowtail butterfly, which means that it's... Um, split bilaterally with male patterning on one wing and female patterning on the other wing. And we, we talk a lot about queerness in nature um, or uh, anything between like uh, transgender like behaviors and species. There are so many fish that naturally like change gender over the course of their life <laughs> um, or homosexual behavior in, in species as this like goal of uh, making the natural world uh, less separate from uh, LGBTQ life, like it's been separated forcibly through um, the history of science and who's teaching it. Um, but the, the world is very queer and um, the, the film casts that as well as part of the underlying methodology in this transformation to bring about a queer future. So, Thank you. I think one of the things I observe from what you say is, is that groups that are actually excluded come under huge pressures and ironically, you know, through this pressure, they create because they have to create in order to resolve problems, in order to create a space for yourselves and the narrative and so on. So very often this creativity you'll find in individuals doing things that are extraordinary for their own communities in order to find a pathway to be included. So it's not just about the mainstream doing things for them, they are doing things for themselves. So I come to Taishan. Invitation, you know, we talk about diversity, how rigid some institutions are academically, talking about things very theoretically and so on. We talk about contact with nature and so on. And in your work, you've actually had to create those pathways to contact with nature and education and so on. Could you tell us something about your gardening projects and other ideas? Yeah, so my, my experience and route into gardening and nature, I mean, I, I always said that I'd Growing up, I was inspired by nature, but never would I call myself a gardener. And I think my mum's influence had a big part to play in my love for, for nature, and then eventually coming into the world of gardening and then understanding about the environment a bit more and how, how um, disconnected we are and disengaged we are, both socially and environmentally. And I think um, after the Grenfell Tower fire, um, it was in those days after the fire that um, I realized how powerful nature is in bringing people together, in healing people, in being able to um, intergeneration intergenerationally connect um, and just open up that space to have those conversations. I was standing next to people that I had no clue who they are and I probably still couldn't tell you who they are. Um, but we had conversations, very deep conversations about our, our own problems, but also collectively as a community, um, those problems that we were facing. Um, and it was that that then inspired, um, I guess, that, that organic evolution uh, of Grow to Know to be created, which um, hopefully will act as a, and does act as a vehicle to hopefully inspire a younger generation um, to get involved in the garden, to try and break down some of those barriers. Um, because I think, especially as someone who's kind of born and raised in North Kensington, very inner city, very urban setting, um, you're very passive in your natural envi environment and your natural surrounding, whereas my mum was very much like, oh, look at that beautiful tree and you know, listen to the birds and the sunset. And I think not, not everyone has those influences. Um, and I think we need to create more access points for uh, especially young people um, and people of um, different backgrounds, different places, different cultures, to be able to access um, nature, gardening, all the benefits of that, because 
Um, I, I, I'm, I'm a big believer that gardening is the solution to many societal problems that we have. You know, food security, we're talking about mental health, physical health, community cohesion, how we work together. And these are, these are the communal spaces that can act as the catalyst for those changes. Um, it's, it, like, in, in my mind, in, in my area, you've got North Kensington, which is like loads of estates and blocks, so Grenfell Tower being one of them, Trellick Tower being another. I live on Lancaster West Estate. And um, there's a real kind of communal vibe um, and people always leaning on each other, helping each other. But then down the road, you've got like David Beckham is down the road, Simon Cowell, and they've all got their front <laughs> gardens, their back gardens, their private squares, and it's all very closed off. And I'm like, well, you know, how can you have five minute, five minute walk down the road, like this very open communal public space where people can connect and gather and share teachings and ideas and then there's this whole different culture just down the road and that is very much kind of due to uh, more, many factors but one of them being social social economic background which then ties into um your kind of ethnic origin and i think there's a lot to um, unpack especially in in my area where we've got the Westway that cuts and for those that don't know what the Westway is it's a it's like a, an a road a motorway that cuts through basically where I live, um, 100,000 cars drive past me every day. Um, and you can imagine what that does to the air quality in my area. So there's all these different challenges that have presented themselves. And I've, I've learned, you know, these, these, this isn't, uh, especially when it comes to air quality, that's not something that you see every day. It's not something you realize. It's, it's, a, it's an invisible enemy almost. And I think for me, I'd be doing the younger generations an injustice if I didn't stand up and try to create some of that change, both environmentally and socially, because they both go hand in hand um, with each other. Um, so I guess um, whilst Grow to Know acts as this really happy, you know, communal vibe of bringing people together and, and gardening, there's a really serious kind of political undertone to what we're doing in reclaiming space in the community to try and activate and, and, and uh, enable people to, to be able to not only get involved in gardening, but you know, these spaces can hold a whole load of uh, different creative arts, music. You know, I just think communal space is something that we really need to look at um, uh, it, to, to enable that, that change. Mm. I think that is quite wonderful what you do, but there's always the problem of resourcing, isn't it? And you have your own life to lead, and then you're doing all this stuff, and you need the resources to create spaces. You need to get people to give you the space so it can, can have. And I always think that when we come together as a panel like this, you, know, you listen to Dominic or Lee or Pauline on the screen or Sarah and Tasha, and you say, my goodness, they're so clued up, they know exactly what to do. But behind them are also very talented people, but also a lot of very vulnerable people. So the people who are talented and speak out are taking on that burden of representing very vulnerable people and trying to provide solutions. So the support of the mainstream is really important, isn't it? What do you think, Dominique? Yeah, support of the mainstream is crucial and that stories and voices are actually heard and that marginalised communities' voices are heard because when we look at the media and we look at the mainstream activism and those that are platforms, especially at the high level, what happens is that that dictates the narrative of the climate and environmental issues. And then therefore that dictates the, the demands that are pushed forward and the action that comes out of it, which doesn't refl always reflect or represent these communities. And it's something that I've witnessed at many levels and talking to world leaders and being like, okay, well, this doesn't always, this doesn't reflect with the incredible young people I've been working who are from marginalized backgrounds and do have different issues because inequality in society does affect how you experience the climate crisis. It's not just in a vacuum. And it's so important that that is pushed out more. And there's this great quote that I love that says nothing like about us without us and that you can't create yes. these um, actions and these plans and these policies without consulting communities and that's why it's so important and also like you said that these communities have the resources and the support to be able to create these spaces and be able to actually use their voices and use their skills to push for this. Mm. Lee do you have anything to add to that? Well just on your note on um, 
as, as consultants, it's like, well, being elevated beyond consultants. <laughs> like, it shouldn't just be that these organizations need to tap into marginalized groups um, for advice on what they're doing, but, you know, it should be core <laughs> to that organization as it functions, and that the organizations that are, you know, being consultants should be empowered and funded enough to be able to do this work on their own. Yeah, because yeah. communities are actually part of creating and shaping all of this. Absolutely. Now, that conversation leads very nicely for, for me to ask Alice to come and speak to us, because Alice, I know that when we talk about climate justice and having equality and so on, and how we work at it, the processes are so important. And you actually concentrate a lot on the quality of listening, for example. Would you like to share some of your experience of what you want to say, or the layers of exclusion, layer upon layer, whether it's ethnicity, whether it's disability, whether it's your sexual orientation, so on, they all impinge on people in such a way that they're almost, in a way, disabled, generally. So, Pauline, let's hear from you. Yes, thank you, and I think that's an interesting uh, point because we talk a lot in the disability rights space and the disability justice space, where we look a lot at intersectionality, about the social model of disability, which is looking at what makes us disabled in the environment. Um, because obviously we oppose something called the medical model, which just saw us as defective. Um, so yes, and I'm really interested in the, the aspect of layers of trauma. I think a lot of us carry that, especially in marginalized communities. Um, and really we don't we, we can't really achieve climate justice without social justice and you know i'm really interested in what gets people to why do people pay attention to disabled people and interestingly you know um i wish i could say that horrifying stories about disabled people dying because their benefits have been cut which happens very often in this country uh and in many other countries, or disabled people dying at home um, after a hurricane in the US um, because they waited for their carer to come and they couldn't because the roads were, were flooded and they died. And if you look at the headline around that death, it was, she um, gracefully died at home. And I think there is always this idea that disabled people just live really tragic lives and even all deaths are tragic, and but in a beautiful way. Um, so I think these horrifying stories don't get people to pay attention. And I was going to say it's it's not a shame in a way, because as I want to echo what Lee was saying about being seen as vulnerable. And obviously, there are many, everyone is vulnerable to something, first of all. Um, and disabled people are rarely seen as participants. And again, we've got so much to bring to this conversation. If you look at COVID, I worked from home many years before COVID started. And when everyone was asking, how do I balance this new kind of life? What do I do? Everyone turned to us for knowledge. Things like the Staying In, which was an organization launched by a disabled woman who basically created a safe space online for people to join in and just interact with you know, something that shows that we've got so much to bring to the space and yet we're not there or when we are we're portrayed as just vulnerable and just victims. So I think, you know, th there are several things here and I think what is really important is to think about what do we bring? Uh, obviously, I, I wish everyone would open space for us and make that space uh, flexible and interactive, but it doesn't happen overnight. So I've, I've found that whatever marginalized community um, I've personally engaged with or seen seems to be much more listened to when they bring solutions. And I'm part of a project led by Margaret Awood, which is called Climate Utopias, and we're looking at what kind of vision we can provide to society so that people can really embrace that. And um, you know, looking at um, indigenous communities, and I'm really looking forward to he hearing uh, from Sarah, um, you know, how much they can bring to the conversation about interaction with nature and how to nurture nature in a way. So I found personally that coming to the conversation with some kind of solutions, some kind of frameworks, something like flexibility, if you look at what disabled people brought, for instance, that's cool. And I hate the word special needs. I think all needs are just human needs. But if you look at schools, 
uh, what did disabled kids bring to mainstream schools is a flexible approach and every child would benefit from that. But we, we just see that as, oh no, it's an additional thing that we could look at. We don't see it as something that should embed it from the start and would actually benefit everyone. Um, so yeah, uh, I think, you know, as you said, Judy, uh, there are many layers and it's always really hard for people to know where you tap into a layer of trauma because I think so many of us have experienced abuse, neglect, discrimination, I have on many occasions. And you do wonder where is the layer that I'm going to tap into where I need to stop? And the question I think can only be answered because you've got community to rely on. And that's also where mutual aid, whether it's disabled people delivering medication for each other during COVID or people saying, well, I've got your back on this. I can actually, I've done that with the organization. I've got your back. I can help you. I know what the format is and we can get someone to help. Um, because I don't think everyone can do it on their own anyway. And that's where the power of community is so important. And why I think the disability rights movement is so important in that we created those spaces for ourselves, you know, that you talked about. And I don't know if anyone has, sit, has seen the movie, the Oscar nominated movie Crip Camp, but it's basically a bunch of disabled people who came together and created a camp and just interacted without judgment and just lived their best lives. That is wonderful to hear. I think it is so important to, to realize that when people have these so-called qualities that come out of discrimination and rejection and so on, you find that within that, there are extremely valuable things that happen. For example, you can almost say that within disability and so on, because of the nature of their lives, people develop generosity. People develop compassion because they have to. If you don't yeah. relate properly, then you actually have nowhere to go. So the compassion, even towards ourselves, and so on, become part of it. So I think that this sort of appreciation of what is often taken for granted in nature, the access that we can ride mountain bikes through mountains, and also how are the alternative ways of also appreciating through your inner vision and your inner life to be illuminated by certain qualities of beauty and generosity in life and so on is so important. Sarah, would you like to both comment on that and then follow up by talking to us a bit about the spaces where climate activism sometimes do not reach. Some people are not even on the list. You know, how do we then begin to negotiate these spaces? And also, I often found myself when hearing about the Sami people and so on, your tremendous tradition of wandering through different countries. You are a tradition of vast spaces, not one country, but without thinking of ownership and so on, you wandered through nature and became part of it. And now we have come to a, a moment in history where you are forced to settle and all these things about climate change attacking your ways of life, and yet you have very little space to influence that. We would really love to hear from your experiences and what you're doing. Mm -mm. Well, these questions are very like broad, and I could talk about this for like hours. But uh, if I start very um, like briefly, we are uh, affected of uh, uh, this climate change. And also the thing that is supposed to be the solution, and as we don't, it's uh, called the green transition. When you try to uh, like start up mines, green mines to get more minerals, to be able to make this transition to the, the electrical uh, things like the cars. And uh, I really want to ask like, how do we get people to actually speak about the climate changes and about this fair transition because now if i look in sweden uh, we have uh, had this election and the climate change it hasn't been anything about that uh, in the all the campaigns that these parties have had uh, so i really wonder what what happened with the with our crisis where did it disappear and um I really think that it has to start with the politicians, that they have to make this more important because we have 
I mean, we indigenous peoples, we have shown that this is really an issue for us. It's like affecting our lives, our traditional li livelihoods, uh, and also these um, en environmental activists. Um, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, I don't know what, what to actually uh, say about this because it's so, it's, it's like so natural for me that this is actually happening. It's my life. I have, uh, we are in the first, uh, uh, like, park at seeing this, uh, what's happening with the nature, uh, especially uh, when we are, when I am in a reindeer herding family, that we follow the reindeer during the year. And you can see that it can be raining uh, in the middle of the winter in December when it's supposed to be snow. And then the snow like melts and it gets a layer of ice on the ground that makes it very difficult to, to the rangers to find uh, food. And um, so all these, like we are already seeing all of these things happening. And so in the northern part of Sweden and also in the Arctic area, we are really seeing this. And now I lost the question because I started to <laughs> talk a lot. Thank you for giving us that picture. It's really wonderful to, to hear, you know, your view of it. And I also want to acknowledge the fact that you are speaking to us in language that is not yours. So this is our <laughs> great privilege to actually hear from someone like you. Very often we forget that, that people have their own languages and their own ease of speech in their own language, and we just assume that they all have to speak English in order to speak to us. Whereas we, we never try to learn other language so that we can actually speak to people in our language. And then actually English is my third language because my mother tongue is uh, uh, Sami, and then after I speak Swedish and then uh, English. So I have like more of the words is in Sami than in English and uh, Swedish. Yes, yeah, so it's a great privilege for us to, to actually be able to speak to you. But many of us here actually have other languages in our background. I have Chinese in my background. And I'm sure, Dominique, do you have a, another language in your background? No. <laughs> <laughs> Not even as a heritage language? No, well, there is... Um, my. I'm also Jamaican, um, as well as being British and American. I've... Uh, Triple citizenship, actually. But in Jamaica, they speak Patwa, which is like a language, but it's like dialect. Yeah. Yeah. And I do too, Judy. I'm, I'm French, actually. English is just a language I learned at school. So that's, <laughs> I never grew up learning English. So. <laughs> yeah, so I would now like to, to ask Lee, for example, would you like to comment what sort of thoughts did, that come through your mind when you were listening to that? Um, well, I actually had a question for Sada, which is that I have... Um, I worked a bit with um, someone who's Sami in, in Norway, um, who also comes from a reindeer herding family, Merit Anasada. Um, and she uh, spoke to me about what the Norwegian Sami community was going through environmentally, where the government was telling them simultaneously that their, their reindeer herds were too large and they needed to call them. Um, but then we're also marketing that land to industries sometimes sometimes renewable industries <laughs> and saying this land is you know open for industry and development but they had to size down the indigenous population in order to move in industry and i'm wondering if that's happening in norway if you're seeing anything similar in sweden um well in uh, in jokmok where i am from uh, we have uh, this um, it's actually a british uh, mining company who wants to start a mine in uh, in the middle of a ranger herding area uh, in our grazing lands. And uh, we really like see the consequences of that, that people use the green transition and the re renew renewable energy like an argument to actually exploit our uh, areas. And um, yeah, it's really sad that it, it happens because it, people don't, when you haven't, um, when you cannot like put your own uh, uh, thought about how it is to be um, in another ethnic group and know, knowing what's our traditional things that you cannot like understand that this is actually our life you are trying to like erase uh, if I can explain it like that um, it's our like history books uh, the nature because we we didn't have a 
like writing language before in like 50 years ago, I think. Um, uh, and all of this, uh, yeah, I don't know actually what to say. It's really, it's really sad to see how our culture is getting so, so many things trying to come inside and like rip, rip the culture apart. And everything of this affects our rangers and because it's for them we are we're living we are nature people and we have learned that you don't own the lands or the waters it's only for loans and so now you are protecting the areas for your future generations and in the same time respecting your ancestors that did the same job for you and and that mindset it's it's not in the majority uh, community. It's more about uh, the economical perspective to make more money and be more, yeah, having the economical perspective in the first place uh, and not the ecological, the environmental. I think that's so, so important what you say, because in a way we've come so far with this idea of ownership that we've forgotten once upon a time, we just lived on the land. We didn't have leases, we didn't buy the things and so on, we lived from it and we're at one with it. And now we have a world is, that is dictating the idea of ownership. So the people who wander across lands and so on, we look at them and say, you don't own anything, you didn't buy anything, where's your lease? But they mm. have always wandered and that was their way of life and that was their way of actually surviving. So when we are dominated by the idea of ownership and so on, lots of people are basically losing what they ever had. And of course, with colonialism and, and so on, it's the same. You know, once upon a time, you went to, to what we now call the United States, you put a flag down and you claim it in the name of the queen or whatever you are, and say, this, suddenly, this is all ours. And the legacy of the Native Americans and so on. And then, of course, there are other people like um, Dominique here, ask her, expecting her to know another language. But in a way, she might be one of those peoples from whom your language of heritage was taken away from you. You know, through slavery and so on, they now all speak English. Whereas their, their language with which they were, their ancestors were born is actually lost. And myself growing up in Hong Kong as well as a British colony, I too partially have lost my language. When I had English and Chinese in bilingual schools and so on, for whatever reason, my brain took to English more than it took to Chinese. And I started writing poetry and so on in English from the age of seven. And I can speak English far better than I can ever speak Chinese. My Chinese is like a teenager's. <laughs> So these things, are they losses or are they gains? When we come into a, such a multicultural world, and the multiculturalism is another question, do we start saying that it is much better not to dwell on these things, but to become global citizens? You know, what do you think? These are all issues of the day that have come with the structures that we have. These structures tie us to our possibilities and our boundaries. Haitian, would you like to talk to us about something about structures, for example, you know, for example, even all the things you're doing so set within the structures are both possibilities and barriers. And unless we actually see those clearly, we cannot really look into the future. Yeah, and I'm, I'm a big believer that um, as, as a community, um, whether you look at it on a, a local level or, or even wider than that, that things need to be done in collaboration, done with us rather than done to us. Um, so I think, especially my community, are sick and tired of things being imposed onto us. So, um, and I've had, I had the pleasure of speaking with Ron Finley, who's the gangster gardener in um, LA, and he said something that stuck with me. And he said, "If you're not at the table, you're on the menu." And <laughs> what I want to, I made, I made that point because. Your, your everyday environment, your everyday setting, that's not by coincidence. The way that someone put something somewhere, the way that someone laid a paving stone, the way that someone planted a tree, that took people sitting at a table, making a decision based on your... And, and for example, I, I, the, where I live, I go out of my, my, uh, my front door, there's a, there's a betting shop, there's three pubs, there's a couple of chicken shops. 
Then you go down the road to like High Street Kensington, Notting Hill. You have these like health stores, and you have all of these amazing, you know, which obviously, you know, I think a lot of people in my community would feel priced out from those um, being able to access the organic foods or like the healthier things. But it's not by coincidence. And I think when we talk about structures, these are the structures that we're that that we not only are forced to feed into, but it's so hard to see beyond those structures. And I think I, what I'm really keen to do is kind of throw tradition out the door, throw um, the convenience of of tradition out the door, and the way and the way that things have been going on. Because just because um, you've got a system that has been going on for years and years, um, and it's you know, and it's a, a well-oiled old machine, doesn't mean it's helping everyone it's it's not uh, i think it can always be improved but there's a perception of those that are running those those structures and systems that oh everything's fine because everything's fine for them but actually they're they're doing more harm than good so um i i'd kind of like to draw on one of the projects that we did um at uh, Chelsea Flower Show uh, this year in in May where we did the hands off uh, hands off mangrove garden which brought to light um a very local story um, in the 1960s, 70s of um, the Mangrove Nine who confronted pe police brutality um, and then also deforestation of mangroves. And I think it was really important to be there to not only bring those stories to light but also make a statement to the RHS. Um, again, that's another structure, a charity that does amazing work but isn't always highlighted um, because of the perceptions around, for example, your Chelsea Flower Shows where it costs like £100 a ticket to get there and, you know, uh, and it's this very kind of elitist, exclusive space, although they probably won't appreciate me saying that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, off, I mean, off the back of that, um, and I do, I do think there's hope because off the back of that, they've kind of embraced me, endorsed me, and um, we're working together on looking forwards to create more access and, and using those resources. So the gatekeepers, um, like you said, those systems, those structures, these, these are the gatekeepers of resources, of, t of, of materials, of knowledge, of information, and it's just time to open up those doors to be able to give communities like mine who have gone through, uh, gone through uh, the Grenfell Tower fire trauma, um, the cost of living crisis now, obviously the pandemic, and I know that's a shared trauma. And we all feel uh, traumatised in many different layers and levels. Um, I'm, I'm sure um, the Grenfell Tower fire probably touched many people in this room, um, if not everyone. Um, and I think that those gatekeepers really need to um, look at how they can work with communities and not to communities and that's when you get into the kind of field of like ticking a box um it's kind of imposing things onto communities and speaking uh not on behalf of but speaking down to um like my community oh this is what you need this is what you need I actually just ask us what do you think would work how do we move forwards what structure would best suit your community and i think there's a lot of uh connecting to do because um, at the moment there's a big jump between um, both those structures and uh, the, the beneficiaries of those structures essentially we are we are part of those structures um, at the end of the day the people who made decisions of on, on where those shops are going to be or what my road looks like probably don't live on my road probably don't even live in my community probably won't even ever come to that road so I think we need to have more kind of community based um, and um, kind of upskilling um, information sharing um, and connecting so it's not so disconnected my ideal world would be for like my community to rebuild our own community um, uh, in a way that we um, we would like to to live in the sense that I, I always think what if the world was a blank canvas right now and I, this is something I wanted to do with like a, a school at some point like what if the world's a blank canvas how would you build that world up and then then you would then those solutions and you can kind of work out well where are we at now and where's the dream and then how do we kind of get to get from where we are to where we um, hope to be. Um, so yeah, but, uh, and embarrassingly, I've had a few too many chamomile teas. So <laughs> I might need to pop to the loo in a second if that's... <laughs> <laughs> I, know, I've, I know I've jumped from, from speakers up above. You're being yeah. very human. <laughs> so I might actually pop off for two minutes if that's okay. So. Yes, absolutely. But I'd like to really bring Pauline in because uh, Pauline has such a lot to say that we can gain from in terms of, of what we, we were talking about, that we have organizations and structures and so on. And for these structures to, to change, we need two things to happen. One is that the people in charge also have to learn. They need to listen in such a way that they learn and know how to change the structures. 
On the other end is we've got talented people like we have here, who are very articulate and who go to the community and actually find those issues and so on. But they need resourcing. And the other thing is a lot more can be done to actually raise many more people from vulnerable groups to be trained in presentation, to tra be trained to confidently talk to media when they're under pressure, all those things that allow voices to be heard. So Pauline, let's hear from you what you have to say. Yeah, I think I, I'm sorry, Taishan has to go, but completely understand he needed to go to the room. Um, <laughs> but, you know, when he talked about what if there was a blank canvas and you could rebuild and the first thing that came to mind was things like universal design that is something that the disability community talks a lot about and the fact that we never talk about fully accessible nothing is ever fully accessible it's a term that changes and evolves and we need to evolve with it um because people have different needs and everyone is welcome to say well and also some needs can um can actually be contradictory um, so that's really important. Um, so when Taishan was talking about creating a society where we build what we want to see, I was thinking so much um, distress and so much advocacy could be avoided if things were embedded from the start. Um, I just see, you know, with communities, when we talk about ramp access, whether it's the physical environment or social interaction, if things are done from the start, it makes such a big difference because then we're always being told there is a cost problem. It's actually too hard to retrofit whatever. So it's actually that we need to make sure that we are heard and we are asked what we want, but also that those things are done at the right time. Because otherwise, if we're asked, what do you want? But it's way too late and we know it's going to cost too much. We're not there. Um, politicians um i think after 11 years of working in policy i've kind of um i don't want to say give up i will never give up pushing uh ask to policymakers but i just think we need to team up and actually develop communal spaces whether it's online or in real life for people to come together and fight you know um Tayshan was talking about trauma, you know, like I've been shielding for two years and a half. I'm doing this here with a studio where everyone is wearing masks and it's lovely. But I haven't been out really in the world for almost three years. And lots of disabled people are in that situation. And six out of 10 people who died in the UK were disabled. Um, so if you think about, about that uh, and the fact that politicians just had... Um, you know, a panel in their meeting room saying, who are we going to save? And obviously not disabled people. We're not productive enough. We're not glamour enough. We're not interesting enough. Um, so you just think people actually have to come together. Obviously, we need to continue making noise. But I think everything that I've seen despite two years, I've been, I've worked on antimicrobial resistance. I've worked on food and health legislation. I've worked on air pollution a lot. I've worked on clean air zone in the UK. Everything is too slow, too little and not inclusive at all. So I really think that it needs to become hyper local, people reaching out and seeing what are we doing, you know, with our libraries, with our green spaces, because a lot of disabled people are poor. And a lot of disabled people actually, when they make a decision about how they interact with the world, it has to be, is it gonna cost me money? Or can I go somewhere where I feel welcome? And I know I'm not gonna have to use what we call the purple pound. The purple pound is the, the economic contribution by disabled people. Um, so yeah, my take would be God, yes, we need to continue, um, influencing governments. And I've done that through the whole policy reports and meeting with them and nagging them, but they're always going to pick the low hanging fruit. They're always going to be too slow. They're not going to be enough money because the social economic reality of these governments is that everything is short term anyway. So I think people really need to come together and be like, well, resources, well, or, or frameworks, how can we act and protect each other? And that needs to be intersectional, obviously. Thank you, Pauline. Now I would like to bring in Dominic. You know, we've, we've talked a lot about climate activism, exclusion, and so on. We, we all, these three words are becoming very repeated, you know, equality, diversity, and inclusion. And people say it almost in, the, in like an abstract way. You know, we're all committed. We all want equality, diversity, and inclusion. But what is actually happening? For example, on the Young People Fund, we keep congratulating you for speaking out. Do we do enough for you after you speak out? What are you doing to organize yourselves? And how do you think you can get the, the whole society to move as a result of what you're doing? With young people, I think there's 
I mean, a lot of things that happen, for example, what you just said reminded me of something that I face a lot after doing events, particularly with like leaders or whatnot, saying, you you guys are so incredibly inspiring. We're just like, yes, are you going to follow the demands? Like, no, but you're so inspiring. And it's like, we need, as the young people, having our voices heard is so important, but also having that intergenerational fight as well, that this is this requires all of us, is so crucial. And on the point about how climate activism is presented in the mainstream from the activism that I've been involved with from what I'm seeing in the mainstream is that a lot of the intersectionality and a lot of the issues that communities are facing is not re reaching these higher levels and there's actually so much that we can learn from communities that are including issues such as race and gender and how people are unequally impacted and it also includes class as well like this is about not leaving anyone behind and for example, black environmental justice movements in America have actually learned so much from in the community that they have and in how for such a long time they've been including diversity and inclusion. And yesterday, actually right here in Leeds, I went to the youth climate strike that happened and it was a collaboration with Black Lives Matter Leeds where there's actually that intersectional collaboration, that intergenerational collaboration that's happening where issues such as race or people being unequally affected and climate are actually being spoken about together and you, you, feel, you really feel the power in that and it's so powerful. And one thing I also find from working from someone who's from a marginalised background and working with others is that People who are have been facing discrimination in society have always been fighting crises and there's actually so much we can learn from them and skills that they possess that they've had to fight these injustices and show us that there are so many things that seem impossible until it's not and I just think there's so much power in that and for me what I've really been working on is well more in like the youth movement we've come a long way in that making sure that voices on the front lines are being heard and that people are not voiceless, they just need to be platformed and they actually need to be included. An example for Fighters of Future International in creating protests and strikes that are then focusing on these social issues, such as how people are not um, are unequally impacted, such as climate reparations for those who are facing the worst of the crisis but have contributed least to it. And even right here in the UK, one way that we've been trying to include more people in the climate conversation and have like a different outlook that actually involves communities like mine is through music and creating a like a cultural shift the part of climate live what i do is about uniting people through music and then using that as a platform for voices that need to be heard to speak about what they do and campaigns that people can actually be a part of and then empower people and i also think it's a really great way for people to get into climate activism because a lot of what people see is being arrested for example or and these like other forms of climate activism which you face a lot of the police and for communities especially black and brown communities and those who have been you know have faced violence from that that really sets them back from wanting to join in climate activism and just for everyone i think it's really powerful to have other routes in where people can truly feel engaged and empowered in a different way and one thing that I'm currently working on, um, which is happening in London soon, is this Black Ecofeminist Summit, which is bringing together women and black environmentalists who often aren't heard in these spaces, who you don't often see in the media, who are doing absolutely incredible climate activism and work and just shaping our world and bringing that together and creating those spaces where we can feel heard. And it's also so important that people are tuning into these stories, are tuning into what's happening, because what we need is to acknowledge that everyone's at a different point when it comes to environmentalism, but you have to have an open mind of like always learning new things and understand that your experiences in the world and other people are very, very different and that naturally, like intrinsically shapes how you view and perceive the world. And just having that, I think we can get a lot further and a lot further with representation as well in being in those spaces and making sure that no one is left behind because if you have that understanding, you have that intersectionality, you have those social justice issues in your demands and you know about it, then what you're pushing towards world leaders, what you're pushing towards politicians, what you're pushing to the general public is then shaped to include that. 
Thank you. I want Sarah to comment on that, actually, you know, about how you reach your young people. Your young people who are caught up in the beginning of their lives with this transition that you might be forced to make in your traditional life and so on, and how you feel that even in your own country, the climate change agenda is not at government level. So does international support help you? And how does that affect your voices of your young people? Um, well, we, in Saminora, my organization, we have been collaborating a lot with Friends for Future uh, in Sweden where we have been uh, like lifting up these issues like uh, indigenous rights, climate justice, and that this uh, green transition, it cannot happen without um, us being heard. Um, because uh, in the end, it's about our, like our areas, our culture it is about. Um, so it has uh, helped a lot to, to have uh, those voices to help us lift up because we have the same, in the end, we have the same goal to uh, to stop this climate changes, to make it better. Uh, and I have actually been, uh, we have a climate uh, live in Sweden and they are here in Gothenburg at this uh, book fair that we have. And uh, me and Greta Thunberg, we have been in two panels and actually been talking about this. Uh, um, um, can we, save the nature by destroying the nature because that's actually what like happens in Sweden that we the green green transition is more like a green colonialism that we are uh, using uh, the green transition like an argument to start more mines and with that destroying more uh, of our uh, traditional areas for the rangers for our culture for the nature like everything um yeah, so back to the question, it has really been helpful to have uh, strong voices backing up and showing that indigenous issues are also our issues. It's uh, very important to uh, include us in the, um, in the decision making process. And also because we are the people who actually have made that we have, that we still have an earth left. Because without us, the whole world, I don't think we would have like any environmental areas left. Thank you for actually, sharing actually, that, Sarah. I think everything would be in, like an in, in industry or in mines or with windmill parks. Um, yeah. So the, the whole presence of nature is so fundamental to, to your way of life. I don't know if you, all of you really caught something that Sarah was talking about earlier about the melting snow because it used to be that in countries way far north it was so much covered in snow all the time and the snow is sort of powdery it's like sand so that when the reindeer wants to eat the lichen they just push the snow and get at the lichen but when the snow begins to melt it melts and then when it gets colder it forms ice and when it forms ice the reindeer actually cannot get at the lichen it is so and, fundamental uh, isn't it yeah, and one more thing that I don't think people really understand. We are, it's not about the future that we're talking about the future no. crisis. We are actually living in the crisis right now. Um, and that's, I connect to my culture, uh, our, lan uh, our language, uh, it has over 300 words or actually 500 words to describe the snow. And of these words, um, I haven't used every word of them because we don't have those conditions anymore. So what my grandfather experienced when he was a child and those words he used, I don't use them today because I, I haven't seen these conditions when it comes to the snow. Yeah, so on that note, we need to remember that so many signals from the experience of indigenous peoples and not just indigenous people, the whole countries, Pakistan, one third underwater now. So it is so urgent, the issue of climate change. So with all those thoughts and sharing of our experience, ideas, what different groups, their thoughts and their expanded ways of thinking and so on can help us to actually think ourselves into future questions. 
So if you'd like to put up your hand and then someone with a roving mic will come to you and we would like to hear your questions. And when someone asks a question, I would like to also ask people with related issues to that question to say what they want to ask so we have an expanded question that we can actually answer. So the lights are going to come on so we can see you better. Yes, we have someone in the front row here. <laughs> Speak. Okay. Hi, I'm Ying. Oh, I'm, um, I work for South Yorkshire Climate Alliance up in Sheffield. Um, and we're looking at developing a digital hub to engage the local community in sort of wider South Yorkshire in sort of environmental um, discussions and community action. And my question would pertain to how we can promote environmental literacy in an, in an inclusive way. So Given that environmental literacy, like our knowledge about that is constantly evolving, so how can we make that inclusive? Anyone with questions related to that? About creating a digital hub? that is inclusive and helps people to have environmental literacy. Now, many of us, even me, there's lots of areas of the environment I don't really understand. And the more we understand and the more we know how to act, the more effective we can be. Anyone want to add to that? No? Okay, should I ask Lee to start? Um, I have a thought on that. I, it's a little unrelated to the work I've been discussing today, but I have another project that I've been working on that... Um, it's called Symbiotic House, where I'm working in Miami to build an artist residency in a kind of house of the future model that would be a, a regenerative house that generates its own power and its own food and its own, captures its own water. Um, a little bit not off the grid, but that same kind of thinking, but instead tapped into the grid as an act of giving back so that the house becomes a power plant instead of a kind of extractionary force. But um, in part of that I'm doing, I'm not an architect and I'm stepping into the realm of architecture, but I'm trying to do it in a very collaborative way with a lot of uh, open research groups. And so I just built a website that is just symbiotic.house um, that has kind of 11 chapters of research. And in doing this, I was wondering how to create a reading group around uh, that feels open, that people can tap into, that doesn't feel like uh, maybe if there's some kind of literature that month that it's like an assigned book and you don't like it. And then I, I've had a lot of like dropping in and out of reading groups because of that. <laughs> and then it's like, once you miss a meeting, how do you come back? And so I tried to create a space that felt that people could tap into uh, it when they want and for however long they want. And so the materials in the reading list I was putting together are multimedia. They're everything from a, a single image to a, an article to something academic to something poetic to a video. Um, acknowledging that people have different ways of receiving information um, and that a, a diversity of uh, materials and approaches can be helpful in a kind of multimedia reading list. Pauline, would you like to say something? Because I, I, for me, from my experience working with communities, uh, people are at all different stages and at a certain stage they might be ready for a digital hub. But what are the other stages they need to go, go through in order to be even interested in a digital hub? Yeah, I was going to say the first thing is obviously I love all of Lee's ideas, but I think, you know, <laughs> everything I've seen sounds fantastic. And, you know, you've got to remember that a lot of people are low on energy, low on mobility or low on time. And I'm usually, I usually tick those three boxes. Um, so, you know, like my ability to engage with the external world might be limited and I might just switch off and just think, oh God. Um, <laughs> So yeah, a tool that is flexible is the first thing. But I also think that the, a lot of the research that's been done in the UK around the term climate emergency show that people don't, a lot of people from, uh, a lot of people from the disability community don't respond to it because we live in a constant emergency situation. Like I'm not even going to bother you with the number of hours I spend in admin or trying to chase people, trying to get the basic rats that I should have. Um, and it means that you you don't have the time and energy to engage with that conversation if you don't have a very flexible, easy entry point. And, um, you know, a lot of disabled people enter the community through the plastic straw ban. Like a lot of disabled people I speak to just don't even want to talk about climate because they see cyclists as the enemy. Like you would see the fight on social media between cyclists and wheelchair users. It's 
you know, it, it's there. And a lot of people just think, oh God, my life is such an emergency and there is that big thing, but it's harming me. The, the things that are being done to improve the overall health of you know, the planet and everyone is harming me. And there needs to be a conversation here, a, a, you know, some kind of moderator, because obviously I'm not going to go into the whole plastic straw ban, but it was actually even the campaign who launched that, uh, the blue whale said that it was a symbol. And if you look at the overall uh, contribution of plastic straws into the ocean, it's no point no 20, 25% of the overall plastic pollution. So Obviously, plastic pollution is a massive issue, but focusing on the straw meant that people, even in medical settings, couldn't drink or couldn't get their medication. So there was, you know, a big pushback. Um, my take will always be people are busy trying to survive and states don't provide the means. If, you know, you fall ill or you have childcare, you're going to just try and um, get your head out of the water. And, the, and one thing I'm really lobbying for lobbying, I'm not sure I like that word, I'm advocating for is actually for every employer to make time during the working week for people to learn because I think everyone's schedules are busy all the time. Why are you going to squeeze that time and energy? I think one day a week, everyone should learn about climate and how to engage. And I think that would really change something, but it would obviously need to, you know, it needs a lot of work, but I really think that we need to rethink the way we spend our time and energy. And when we do that, we allow people who are juggling two or three jobs or looking, you know, I've got a full-time carer. Will my full-time carer be able to learn as much as climate as someone who has free time? No. So if we enable that and we enable people to feel safe that if something happens to them, there is a support network, then they will be free to spend more time uh, focusing on that. That's a great answer. Sarah, what do you think? For example, at the moment, you know, youngsters are having Fridays for the future where they actually concentrate on on climate changes or perhaps everybody needs a Friday for the future because when we think that we just merrily carry on the way we've always always they carried on and there's no space they've, they've disappeared Sarah it's not just me right yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, not from our end, it's, from it's a okay it's on their end it's not us yeah, it's mm. So, Sarah, would you like to respond about the I digital? I think they had enough of hearing me. They were just like, we're just going to get rid of her. <laughs> <laughs> no, Sarah, would you like to say something? Are they, oh, she they can't hear the us. Chat? Are they saying that? She cannot hear us. Do they see us or is it only... <laughs> I don't know. Maybe they can hear it like chat. And <laughs> we're just disrupting everything. <laughs> so, Sarah, would you like to speak to us about... You know, I lived in Sweden for a year and we went to meet the Sami people and that was oh, incredible. No. They, they can't, can't hear us. They can't oh, hear they us. Yes, we did. <laughs> now we're back. But I, don't think, I don't think she realizes that she's out loud here. Okay. Okay, Sarah, my technician tells me we can hear you and you can hear us now. Would you like to yeah. comment on the idea of a digital hub? Do you think it would work for your constituents? Mm, can, you, can you ask the question again? We had a question about creating a digital hub that is inclusive. Do you think a mm. digital hub can be inclusive on the, its own as a digital hub? And if not on its own, what else needs to happen in order for the two things to come together? So that people are informed about climate. Mm. No, but I think a digital hub would be a good idea. But also to have it um, in school to actually uh, educate people about that and from very uh, young age. And uh, something I see in Sweden that really needs to be implemented in the school is to educate about their own indigenous people. Because people don't really, they know more about native people in America than in Sweden. And that's, uh, um, it's a bit, I don't know what to say because it's, uh, it's strange that you don't know about your own, like your own people and that you have another, that you have two people in Sweden. It's not only Swedes, it's Samis too. Um, and to learn why we, like that we are not against development and when it comes to the like the transition, it's that it doesn't respect our rights. 
or our culture and that we don't have a voice in it, that it's really important to, uh, to teach uh, young children about that. that there, there are more cultures than only your own. And you have to be able to, uh, to like, think in another perspective. And especially when it comes to the, um, to the nature, because it's so, it's a really important. Yeah, we all know it's very, very important now because we live in, in the middle of a, of a crisis. Thank you very much. So, so some of the answers we, we're getting is, is that digital is not for everyone. That needs to be some kind of bridging thing in order to do it. And the, some of the, the content also needs to be localized and relevant to the people we're talking about. But another dimension that actually occurred to me is, as part of the digital hub, should there be social media associated? The social media is so powerful. Would you like to say something about that, Dominique? Social media is really powerful in getting the word out about things. And because it's so like quick, a lot of people can kind of read, for example, an infographic or a few slides that like quickly tell them about a topic. And also because social media can be like very fast paced and reactionary, like a lot of people can get more tapped into things once it becomes viral, it becomes a moment. But I think it's really useful to attach that to online resources because it's not enough for people to like actually learn in depth about topics, but it's enough to really pike interest. And we have to look at the world now that so many people are on social media. And I do think there's a lot of power to tap into there, to connecting that to resources and connect that to on online resources for people to join. So you're saying that besides linking and so on, you also mentioned infographics. Now that's interesting because again, you know, the visual things, the things that have real impact besides reading loads and loads and loads of information can be very tiring and not that interesting. So the content has to be interesting. The content has to have shortcuts to the messages, like infographics and so on, are really interesting. And of course, use of all kinds of things that we've been talking about so much in storytelling. And perhaps with the digital hub, it's, it's not a standalone. I think the whole message going along that is that a digital hub is really important because we've got to have information, but it cannot be standalone, especially if you want to be inclusive. So you need to go to the people you want to include and see which is the entry point, which is, is uh, Alice's words, the entry point into being involved. And perhaps even events and so on that can be linked, live events, but linking to the fact that there's always information there if you want it would be very useful. Any other questions? Yes. The gentleman with the red... Uh, White sheet of paper. Oh, red book now. <laughs> yes. So the mic is above you. Thank you. Uh, and thanks for all the contributions so far. There's a certain inevitability in these conversations, as was proved today, that we end up talking about socio the socio-economic context and realities. Uh, I'm a community education worker, I work in disadvantaged, poor communities, and one of the voices, it's not the only voice certainly, but one of the loudest voices is that activism, it's a luxury, it's for other kinds of people. And, um, you know, it was mentioned a moment ago that one of the resources you need is time, and very many people in communities, they don't have the time to invest in activism. So I've got two questions for everybody really. The first one is, how do you pay the bills? And the second question is, how do we secure the, the resources needed for activism? Did you hear that question? Uh, Dominique is very keen to answer that. <laughs> so it's about how do we pay the bills? Because everything has a cost, whether it's time or resources, and, uh, and related to activism. Yeah, definitely. It's a, it's a really big issue with a lot of people that I talk to that just don't have time because they're, you know, working to literally survive. And one thing that I'm pushing now and that more people are trying to push is the fact that a lot of the different skills that people have and a lot of different roles people have ca can be less time. You don't have to be a full-time activist, but also that it needs more funding so that people can be paid to do this work because a lot of time it's looked at and people say well you shouldn't be paid for activism that's something you should do at the good of your heart it's like people also have to live um and that is something that's really important that work being funded and 
there are a lot of voices now popping up to really get more funding streaming into that so people can actually have time to do this while still being able to live and it also just touches on some of the recent collaborations and connections that have happened particularly with um, trade unions and I think that it's really important that this is also seen as a class struggle as well particularly in the UK right now with the energy crisis it's so linked to this social crisis as well and people uh, to the climate crisis and, pe and that the fact that more fossil fuel um, more fossil fuel projects won't lower people's energy bills and that you know Possible companies like BP and Shell lining their pockets with endless profits is actually also at the expense of people as well as the planet. And I think building those connections as well so that this, so that people, um, especially disadvantaged people and poor people and work-class communities actually have a place in this movement. And yeah, I really think that is something that needs to be pushed forward. And, and it's good to see some progress, you know, some organizations and so on now have set up payment for participation. They will pay people from disadvantaged groups if they have to take time off from work to attend a committee meeting. If they're consulted, even very ordinary members of the community, there's now payment. And there are changes within the funding systems like the Esme Fairbain Foundation, so, where if you set up a project to involve diverse community groups, especially excluded groups, one of the budget lines is payment for participation. This is just a beginning. You know, we, we really need to have a movement that where the voices are actually there and the voices are nurtured and actually trained and are articulate about voicing and being making decisions at the table as well. Taishan, do you want to say something? Yeah, I just wanted to say that you can't tell me that the resources aren't there to fund community initiatives, projects, ideas. I mean, you look at um, the test and trace system, for example, you're like... I just think resources, and we go back to talking about structures and gatekeepers, and actually it's their priorities um, and agendas that I think we need to um, hold them accountable for those um, as well. And it's, so, it's really hard because I guess there's kind of the grassroots movement organization, organization um, and trying to work from the ground up, but also trying to, I guess, drag them down. Not, you know, it, but trying to find a middle ground, essentially, because... Yeah, I mean, again, Chelsea Flower Show, the resources are there. Imagine if, you know, the resources put into um, those spaces were then created, uh, you, you turn that into more legacy-filled, purposeful spaces in the community. The, the marble, what was it called? The Marble Arch Mound. What was that, six, six million pounds or something like that? For a, a temporary space um, in, in a very um, uh, kind of uh, um, densely populated area. Imagine putting six million pounds into a local community where they're going to have a garden or an outdoor space or an initiative and educational engagement that is all about um, legacy. And I think that's what we need to look at. And, and so it, like, when I'm having those meetings or when I'm looking at partners and funding, it, it really is frustrating because you often get like the, 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 the five grand or two grand and that's a luxury in itself. Or you, the perception is that is a luxury in itself, but it shouldn't be actually... The, the funding is, is out there. I just think the agendas and the priorities are completely way off. And I think it's those systems and structures that we need to kind of uh, have a rethink. Um, and we can only do that because it's such a big structure. We can only do that collectively. And I think we, uh, what I'm really keen to do uh, with my nonprofit, Grow to Know, is try and find the resources to try and pilot and showcase. Because it's all just a conversation until, it's, until, you're show, until you're actually doing it. Once you do it, you say, oh, look. Like there's exhibit A, here's exhibit B, here's exhibit C. All of a sudden, they haven't got a leg to stand on, and, and they can't ignore it. Or you'd like to think so. Maybe I'm I'm being unrealistic there, but um, I think it's just they're holding it, holding um, those structures, those um, gatekeepers accountable, and trying to really, um, yeah, trying to open that um, those resources. Absolutely. I mean, what you're talking about and the voices of people like you and so are beginning to be heard and things are uh, actually moving. But, you know, this whole thing about information as well. I know of one or two organizations like Esme Fairbank who now says that they want to partner, especially with very small groups, to do work with them. And it's not an application, it's an expression of interest. You go and you talk to them and they will talk to you and they will find out what you want to do and, if possible, fund that partnership. So it is beginning, but this is minuscule compared to the needs that are actually 
really needed right across it. So we need to keep up the pressure and, and also say that, well, you're doing this, but has Taishan heard about it? <laughs> you know, this is the, the other way, the coming together of the two things for things to happen. But certainly the pressure for resources and the justification is beginning to be heard. So let's keep up the pressure. Was there some other hand? That's Judy, oh. Judy, if yes. I can quickly just comment on that question. I don't know if you can hear me. Yes. <laughs> yeah, no, I just wanted to quickly comment Please. because um, uh, I think, you know, the social economic problems, if I know a lot of people aren't aware of the issues that are happening with social care in this country, but a lot of people like me are asked to wear diapers rather than having carers coming around. You've got local authorities telling people, sorry, we'll have people come three times a day to feed you and then no one to come to get you to bed or you go to bed at six. So, you know, we've got this kind of social care issues um, that I think this, this gentleman was, you know, touching upon. And if you don't solve that, you're never going to get those people to engage. If you don't meet basic needs, people going to the yes. loop, people sleeping, yes. you're never going to get those people on board. If you don't meet basic needs for dignity and rights, you're never going to get that kind of engagement. And also, one thing I wanted to say, the money is there. Look at the profits made by BP and Shell. If you think about the money problem, it's almost like food waste. It's like it's there. It's just it's wasted in the wrong things or it goes in the bin. So the money is actually there. It's just it's misplaced. On the one hand, you've got these people making millions of profit and then you've got people being asked to wear diapers. So, yes, the money is there. It's just not well uh, spread. <laughs> Yes, again, the pressure has got to be on and the basics, you know. If people cannot get the basics of life, they can't extend themselves into other issues and be interested and be participating. Thank you, Polly. So, was there somebody over there? Hi, um, Mia Maker. Thanks, everyone. Uh, my name's Harriet. I'm a lecturer in climate change at the University of Leeds. So, first, I have an invitation. I'd love for you to come and talk to our master students, not for free. Uh, <laughs> yes. Um, and, and my question is one that I get regularly from my students about how do you maintain working in climate activism when it can be such a roller coaster of emotions? How do you manage that sort of personally and within the groups that you work with? So, let's hear from all of you. How do you manage this? drastic roller coaster of emotion when you are people who are in touch with the vulnerable. Dominique. Yeah, it's really, I th thank you for that question. I think it's really important that we touch on the emotional side of it and the mental health side of it. You know, climate anxiety is something, or eco-anxiety is something that's been a term that's really <laughs> sprouted up. And for me personally, how I deal with it is by having this community of activists, I have people I found I can talk to about what I'm going through and also just seeing and learning about the amazing work that's already happening really gives me more hope for the future and makes me see that there's so much collective power in all of us and that honestly lifts my spirits so much and I think that's really important that people have those communities and those hubs where they can go to and they are out there and also just embracing joy as well. And I think we need a lot of that and finding moments to cultivate joy and that actually joy sustains activism. And I don't think that's something we push and talk about enough. And it's so important that we have that, um, that joy and just engaging other things that make you happy through the climate, like music and arts and culture, for example. That's the two things that really ground me and keep me sane on this journey. <laughs> So, Lee, how do you keep saying? Well, you knock that out of the park. That's, <laughs> the joy is so critical. Um, I, I'm going to strongly advocate for the art here <laughs> um, because uh, this is actually the first panel I've been on where I'm uh, being classified first as an activist. I, I'm an artist and I advocate for climate solutions. Um, and so um, it's, it's a little intimidating to be here with hardcore climate activists. <laughs> and I'm, I'm so thrilled that also there's this undercurrent that we haven't talked about too much, but every one of us is involved in the arts somehow. Um, and so I think that it is this critical way of seeing that provides a lot of that joy for me. Um, but like in terms of just approaching uh, the climate like crisis, I think that the largest issue is an issue of how to how to visualize and imagine it because it's so not how we've evolved to process threats. 
we're very much uh, an animal at our at our core, and we respond to things that are uh, urgently, presently, locally in front of us. Um, and the climate is none of those. It's dispersed. It's invisible. It's happening right now somewhere else, or it's happening right here, and it's hard to see that it's different from the weather, or it's happening in the future. And it involves this kind of um, intergenerational collaboration with people that aren't born yet. <laughs> and it involves this kind of like deep visioning of placing yourself in other places in the world or in other time frames, um, or, you know, sometimes it's right in front of you and you don't understand that it's a crisis. Um, and so I think that uh, effective storytelling and art is critical in developing new narratives, new fictions, um, in, especially in a world right now that's so moving towards post-truth, that we're so, you know, stuck in our, um, our evidence and our rationality. I think a lot of Climate people are, like myself, very logical people, um, but that's not the kind of effective storytelling that reaches the mainstream anymore, which is horrifying. But I think, um, you know, adapting a bit to successful stories, and not just in, in visual art, but of course in films, in music, in protest anthems, in, in writing, and in, across all creative disciplines. So you're really channeling your energy. Yeah. You got it. <laughs> because, uh, because I was going to come in on that and say, you know, in the East, we have techniques for centering. You know, all of you have heard of it, and many of you will already be doing it. Things like meditation, where we come back to center, and we believe that all energy is the same. So that when we are very angry or very frustrated, if we come to center, we transmute that energy into positive energy active energy. So next time you see anger, you actually say, wow, I'm going to have more energy to do my work. <laughs> if I can go through my calm center and come out the other end with that positive action energy that actually helps patient. Well, I'm going to be really honest and quite vulnerable in saying that I really do struggle. Um, kind of, I'm very conflicted in um, this calling this a role or this being a career of some sort. I wish that Grenfell didn't happen. I wish that this wasn't the situation that we're in. Um, and what, I guess, what drives me, what motivates me, I guess my mum, uh, who passed away two years ago, she was the one who inspired me into this kind of, this, this gave me this kind of lens into nature. So I kind of see that as, leg her, I can see, kind of see what I do as her legacy. Um, I've also got two young children who um, I want to give them the best opportunities, um, but also like, the, the young children, the future generations. And so, yeah, honestly, I really do struggle. Every time I walk past Grenfell, I see Grenfell, I, I feel anger. I feel anger listening to interviews of, of politicians. I think, I think there's a lot of built-up anger within. And I've been kind of on autopilot for the last five years. And, um, I, and, and like you touched on there, uh, one thing that my mum did um, teach me is how to channel those angry, um, negative energies into something that um, looks forwards is positive um, where you know uh, and, and yeah I do struggle sometimes um, but I think my most um, productive times is when I've like heard a, an interview of, of like a politician saying something I don't like and it'll be like three in the morning and suddenly I'll send out like 10 emails <laughs> <laughs> I'll be like oh. Or, it, or it'll be like, a, you know, great, you know, a past Grenfell, I'm like, oh, you know, like it really does motivate me. Or like my, my son will ask, something, ask me something about plastic bottles and waste. And um, I think those are the things that drive me. Um, but I'm still trying to figure, figure that out myself. Like, I, I, I do feel really conflicted. So, Sarah, can I go yeah, to yeah, the other two people? Uh, Sarah, if you have something to say to us about how you manage your emotions? Mm, I think Dominic explained it very well that you have to have the people to talk to and then uh, I mean for me I have the music so I can express myself uh, through that and then I also have this very like clear vision why I'm doing why I'm doing this thing it's for uh, for our future generations and for me to be able to uh, give my future children uh, the thing that my uh, ancestors gave me, and that's uh, the ring you heard in my culture and uh, my language. Uh, mm. And Alice, how do you do it? So, several things. I think um, 
the community is really important, but I think, you know, it can be, it can be overwhelming. There are a lot of emotion, there are a lot of feelings and thoughts that come from other people. And it can be really hard to know where your boundaries are and how much time and how much of your life you want to dedicate. And also it's really hard to know when to stop advocate, advocating. Um, so my take is rest is resistance. You need to stop sometimes, you need to take breaks. People can t take turns. It's fine if you need to stop to take a complete breaks. There was actually a project called the NAP Ministry, um, which was created by a black disabled woman. And I find it really, because rest is not just sleeping. Rest can be so many different things and there are so many forms of rest. And um, there's also something called the isolation journals that I'm part of. And it's just an hour where everyone comes together and there's a prompt or you can write something else. It doesn't have to be about climate. Um, because I found that my life was just becoming climate and disability, climate and disability. I already <laughs> lived the whole disability thing and I just needed something else. So I've got art, but then I would tend to go into artivism and I would go to art and climate and was like, no, I want to learn how to make a carrot cake. I'm going to learn how to make <laughs> something else. And it's actually making and being part of other spaces that sometimes have nothing to do with climate or disability that I think helped me. And I felt re-energized going back to them. Thank you. So before we come to an end, I'll let Dominique say something. I'll just ask, are there any burning questions you want to ask or shall we come to an end? There's a burning question. <laughs> <laughs> Over here, a question on fire. Uh, just a, a little bit of a random question. How have you found that maybe like Trumpism in the last few years <laughs> has really kind of impacted your messages? Because everything you've said tonight has been absolutely brilliant. But have you found that you've been like beaten back by like false news and false messages? Has it really kind of hurt the good messages you're trying to get across? Should we start with the American? <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll start with an apology from the American on, on behalf of the country. <laughs> yes, Lee has come all the way from Miami to be with us. <laughs> to, now to, he's to going apologize. to take to responsibility for, for the Americans. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, my project was founded maybe two months after that election. And so I was very much responding to it. I was the first year watching how his first six months, there was almost every day an erosion of some kind of rights. There was the stripping away of um, national monuments and national parks. There was the removal of any mention of AIDS from the White House website and the AIDS Council that was doing good work. There was just this like slow violence happening. Actually, it was very fast. It was fast violence in <laughs> contrast to the usual slow violence of climate change. But like it was... Uh, just what, and so the the project at first was very responsive to that. We had um, an, an exhibition called Common Survival that sought um, uh, community uh, submissions about um, survival strategies for queer people or environmental entities in some way, and we organized a publication around that. Um, since then, I think our audience is generally skewed more towards the queer community, and so we don't have a lot of uh, like hostile pushback from uh, maybe the Trump constituency in any sense. Uh, we've gotten a couple nasty emails <laughs> out of the blue, but nothing uh, too too harmful from it. But it's I think that our like we view the community first and foremost that we're trying to reach as queer people and bringing them further into environmentalism, um, and then secondary the larger community and talking about then queer strategies um, that can be useful across uh, backgrounds. So yeah. Yes, uh, I've heard from my American friends, Trump and so on, is that on the one side, he created a lot of damage. On the other side, he's feeding a revolution. Exactly. That, that he is yeah. actually in America more than ever. The awakening is absolutely fantastic. I hope Boris did the same for us. <laughs> you know, it's, do we have enough awakening to counterbalance the damage? Yet? I think the problem is where power lies. Okay, the opinion is coming out, all this awakening stuff is coming up everywhere. But do we have power and how do we take that power for change? It's actually the big, big question. So how do you think we take the power? To issue? I think, well, I've been, I mean, when I was in 2017, when Grenfell happened, I had no interest or idea around politics and I still really don't have too much 
um, extensive knowledge, just open and honest about that. Um, I just see what people say um, and don't agree with it because I see the realities of um, the decisions that are being made. And so I feel, I feel, and I can maybe speak on behalf of quite a few young people, feel quite cornered um, just because of the lack of access to understanding politics, but also um, the consequences of decisions being made of, of, by people who don't represent me, don't represent what I stand for, don't represent my, my upbringing, the way I've lived, nothing to relate to. Um, and I, I understand we talk about democracy, but you know, we, people, people, my neighbours, people that I live amongst, are really being pushed to the edge. Um, and it, and um, yeah, whilst I can't comment extensively on politics necessarily, I just think that, like you said, hopefully there is an awakening because, uh, and I guess what, what I want to try and do with our work and get Grow to Know is um, kind of sidestep that conversation around politics and do our own thing and just showcase how things can be done. And I guess that's really hard navigating um, kind of away from those big conversations and being involved in those because um, that is where legis legislative change and policy change um, can can happen, but um, I've got no faith whatsoever um, in in the political system. Um, I think Grenfell is the perfect example of that. Um, and so, yeah, I, I guess that frustration that I was talking about earlier, hopefully channeling it channeling it into finding new experimental, you know, and piloting new ways and ideas of of moving forwards because yeah the ways that we've been doing things um, to this point just haven't been working clearly um, and it, it's, for, it's pushing people further um, it, vulnerable people especially further um, you know into the abyss so um, yeah I, I don't really get too involved in the, the specifics around politics I but just at the same that time I, I think like what, what you're saying and listening to all of you talking about it is that within our lives and within our comedy, communities, there, it is true that there's a certain amount that we can do for ourselves. And many of us do that. And many community groups are formed because they feel they can do that. But beyond a certain boundary, without power, nothing changes, which is what Pauline is talking about. There are certain things before, beyond which you cannot do it for yourselves. You've got to have I mean, systemic change. It's, it's unbelievable the lack of accountability once someone is elected. You can make any promise. There is no timeline, no budget, no climate impact, money, quality impact. Money. You attach all that to every promise and you don't put them on a bus. You put them on a paper and you put all the consequences of it, all the assessment of every decision and you communicate that. We need basically groups of people scrutinizing every decision and policymakers don't stick to what they promised and they did it in a... Um, in, in a way that looks at all the aspects of this decision, then they should lose their jobs because it's not right that all the, the power we've got is when we vote. And you know, uh, the disability rights community is constantly fighting for the vote to right. And I'm always like, sure, but I agree with Station. We need the communities to happen. We need people to support each other locally, but also we need to not allow what's going on in terms of politics. We, we shouldn't allow people to make decision after decision that will impact communities without any accountability. And that extends also to the UN. The UN is doing a great job in many different aspects, but if you look at the UN, they are mostly, well, first they are funded mostly by governments, but also there is no accountability of what the UN is doing. There's no one above the UN and they are mostly a diplomatic platform. They have no right usually to criticize governments. So you actually need a proper, and I know they launched now uh, with Antonio Guterres, there's a new platform to actually look more at accountability, but we need that to be spread at every level and everyone looking at every promise that is made locally, nationally, internationally, and every policymaker to be held accountable. Great. Now, before we go any further, I need to say to you that we've been told that if we want to, we can run over time. <laughs> We're now eight minutes over time, and you're still here. <laughs> but uh, I also want to say if anyone needs to go, we won't be offended. We're just going to, to finish this question, and then we're going to, to do our wrapping up of a couple of sentences from each person and hope you that have enjoyed this session. So I, I will now go on to Sarah. Sarah, do you have anything to add to that? Not really. <laughs> <laughs> yes, a lot has been said. Dominique, have you got anything to add to that? And to that question that you said, I think despite the like setbacks that we've had, and it can really feel like one, that 
even throughout all of these like political changes, there have been like the seeds planted and everywhere you look, there are pockets of resistance happening. And there's still that movement, like the fact that we still have such a big climate movement shows that people are still um, pushing forward and looking around the world at certain wins that have happened, um, even against like oil and gas companies recently. And even the fact that the recent well, our current Prime Minister, uh, Liz Truss, um, lifted the ban on fracking, then there was this massive pushback from communities who actually lived there who were saying, no, like, we don't want this back. And so even when you have those things that are setbacks, you still have that resistance that has been there, that has stayed quite strong. And I think it's just really important to remember the kind of ripple effects of change that we've already created that will continue. And that's something that yeah really keeps me going as well, especially looking at disastrous decisions of this government. <laughs> okay, so no more burning questions? Okay, so Dominic, would you like to start? We're going to wrap up now. So in one sentence, what do you think is wrong with activism that's most important? And then follow up by telling us, how do you have fun? So what I think was wrong with activism, uh, need more dancing and fun and joy. There's actually a quote that says, if I can't dance in your revolution, I don't want to be a part of it. Um, <laughs> it's more boogies at protests. Uh, that's what we should be doing, um, going up to parliament, dancing. <laughs> but then what I also do um, to have fun um, is dancing. So that leads in pretty well. <laughs> Thank you, Lee. Um, wow, okay. I think maybe the one thing I didn't bring up in terms of like issues with like mainstream uh, climate activism and media coverage of it is this like obsession over like the one one person the like figurehead of a movement when like it is of course behind each of us is also like teams of people we work with as well um, there is this like just very broad and it's like it's hard to tell that story and so I understand why it's told the way it is but um, that the the climate movement is made up of you know millions of people it's not <laughs> not the couple you can name on your hand <laughs> yeah. um and then one thing i do for fun is i'm i'm really into birding i've been really into birding <laughs> since i was like 12 which was a really nerdy time to be into birding but i think i saw it as like real life pokemon at the time and i've <laughs> i've loved it ever since <laughs> um I, I i'm so glad to see like young faces in the audience today i think that like i've been to a few events and a few talks and and I've been asked to speak about young people but I'm speaking to like an <laughs> like <laughs> not young people um old, let's say older people um and <laughs> and I think um yeah I think that's something that um we could really change because um uh, even uh, a week or two ago I, I was asked to talk about young people and our experience and how they could change um um, what they do, but actually there were no young people in the audience, and I was the only youngish person there. Um, and so, yeah, I think including that, those younger generations in those conversations and, and putting trust in young people as well, I think um, there's a very patronizing, kind of um, condescending kind of approach sometimes uh, to, to young people and their involvement and, and their interests in uh, the environment and, and climate activism as well. Um, and what I do for fun, um, I, I still play football, um, not at, not in the Premier League, um, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, I mean, like I said in the beginning, like football was my my passion initially. It was my ambition. Um, I have quite a few friends who are playing football at a very good level. I play semi pro um, for a team called Bedfont, right next to Heathrow. Um, so yeah, I still I still play football, and that kind of in a similar way to gardening takes me to a different realm. So as soon as I'm on that pitch, whether I'm wearing my football boots or my gardening boots, um, I'm in a good place. So. <laughs> Thank you. And Alice? Um, so what's wrong with climate activism? I just think the problem is it's, it's still alive, right? We shouldn't even be having climate activism anymore. We should have achieved what, <laughs> you know, science told us 30 years ago. So what's wrong is that it's, it's not dead, basically. Um, that we still need it. And I we just want to enjoy living now in a society that has, re, you know, been revolutionized and not have to think about what I need to do to get there. We should be in the implementation phase, not still advocate, advocating for the principles of it. And what I do for fun, um, I'm actually going to be looking into beekeeping. I'm a massive uh, fan of pollinators in general and i'm hoping once i get my wheelchair i can try and see what it looks like to be a wheelchair user and a bee uh beekeeper so um yeah i'll keep you updated on that not sure where that's gonna go <laughs> so sarah uh, i agree uh, 
what's wrong is that we we still have to um, to do it. And uh, but the good thing is that we, I mean, we are the people who act, who react and act. Um, and I, yeah, I, I stop there. <laughs> and what do you have fun? If I have fun, what do you do to have fun? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, what do I do? I I sing and uh, I am with my animals and yeah. Great. So that leaves me. So <laughs> what's wrong with activism? Exclusion. I think that's a big thing because a fast missing, very interesting and necessary contribution from so many different groups, as you can see today. And how do I keep my balance and, and have fun? I enjoy nature. When I was a very young, very overwhelmed and depressed young person, I had a wonderful mentor in a university lecture. And she said to me something I didn't quite understand then. She said to me, Judy, don't you see? Isn't it wonderful that the day begins? And that is what I remember when I want to balance myself and take myself with joy into the future. So I want to thank my panel, my wonderful, wonderful panel, and thank you for the wonderful audience. Thank you very much. <laughs>